today's tutorial, I'll be going through the codes of conduct for nurses and midwives. The code of conduct is an overarching practice standard describing the behavior and conduct all nurses and midwives are professionally accountable to. It's also a resource for members of the public to understand to understand what, what to expect from nurses and midwives when receiving care. So in today's tutorial, I'll go through the ethical, ethical principles, capacity, what is meant by capacity, and then I'll go through the code of conduct for nurses and midwives to 2008. So you must always keep yourself up to date to the new codes of conduct for nurses and midwives as things change. Okay, so ethical principles. Autonomy. This means respecting the patient's decision about their own care. So nurses must respect the dignity of the patient and show respect for the patient's decision. And they must understand that a patient's decision for a treatment is influenced by their beliefs, their culture, and their values, and their social and economic status. Another principle is non-maleficence. Non-maleficence. Non-maleficence means do no harm. And it's the moral duty to do no harm. If a patient, if a patient, if a particular, sorry, so if a particular treatment is, if a particular treatment will do more harm than good, then a nurse should not use this treatment and consult a doctor or a physician and other healthcare professionals. So it always means non maleficence means do no harm. Beneficence means you must determine the most beneficial treatment for a patient by doing a risk benefit analysis. It's essential to not inflict harm, whether it is intentional or unintentional, through reluctance, negligence, or ignorance. However, in situations, for example, when there is a search, for example, a surgical procedure or an operation, then the healthcare professional must reduce the harm. So they must take care to reduce the harm. It's it's for this reason that it's for this reason the notion of do care has to be applied by a healthcare professional. And in this situation, for example, if a treatment in which, so for example, if there is a, a drug or other treatment and this treatment is likely to have side effects which are which will cause more harm than good then it's the healthcare professional's responsibility to not give that treatment to the patient so that is all that that is the ethical principles that all midwives and nurses must follow so autonomy respect the dignity of the patient and their decision non maleficence do no harm beneficence promote patients best interest so the definition of code of conduct. The code of conduct is ethics for professional association, which incorporates values, principles, and professional standards and is followed nationwide. So now we move on to capacity. So capacity is the mental ability to make informed decision about, a, it's the inf um, so it's the mental capacity for a patient to make their own decision about their own health care. And this decision must be informed. So the patients must have all the details required about the treatment. They must have the complete understanding of what their treatment their treatment consists of and they must be mentally stable. So for example, in the UK, a person has to be 16 years of age and over to make a consent decision to consent to medical treatment. However, children under the age of 16 must be accompanied by a parent or a guardian. So that's what nurses and midwives have to be aware of. So incapacitated patients. So the capacity for a person to make a decision can be impacted by their age. For example, if they're a young child, then their parents or guardian must make a decision for them. However, in situations, for example, there is um munchens by proxy syndrome. In those situations, then the health professional must make an analysis and understand and try to understand what's going on. So always ask the patient, for example, even if it's a child, ask them and make sure you directly talk to them. You can get some assistance from the parent, but make sure you make the child feel involved and ask them questions as well. So other factors that impact a person, a person's other factors that impact a person's capacity to make an informed decision can be mental health, disability, neurological diseases, psych psychostimulants, 
So all those factors must be taken into consideration. So incapacitated patient, it's not up to the healthcare worker to make an informed consent for the patient. They must always consult a patient by speaking to the patient. So first option is to have patients speak through advanced directive will proxy or surrogate. So this means that the patient could speak through a translator or have someone that they trust and feel comfortable with there or use technologies to communicate with the patient. Whoever that will be speaking on behalf of the patient must be selected by the patient. So give the patient the autonomy to select the medium by which they want to communicate through and whoever they select to be present. This can be a family member, a guardian or a social worker. Decisions must be in the best interest of patients and not the representative. So make sure that the, rep the representative is not making a decision on behalf of the patient. So for example, in the case of munching by proxy, make sure that the person, the parent is in a stable mental state to be making a decision for a child. Patients decide ahead of time. So give patients enough time to decide their treatment. Patients decide ahead of time the type of treatment they want. Okay, so about the nursing and midwifery council. As a nursing and midwifery student, you must make yourself aware of the nursing and midwifery council. They are a regulatory body for England, Wales and Scotland, Northern, I Northern Ireland and, and Ireland. They set standards for training and education that nurses and midwives need to follow. So the nursing and midwifery code of conduct states that you must treat people as individuals and respect their dignity. You must respect people's right to confidentiality. Confiden so with regards to confidentiality, you must respect people's right to confidentiality. You must ensure people are informed about how and why information is shared by those who will be providing their care. You must disclose information if you believe someone may be at risk or of harm in line with the law of the country in which you are practicing. So for example, if you come across a patient with bruises all over their body and you believe there is domestic abuse, but then the patient does not want to disclose that, then you explain to the patient that you will be sharing, for example, this the information that they provide you with, with other healthcare professionals and also other agencies might get involved, such as social workers and the police so one re one sharing information there are legislations that you must follow so here i'll be going through legislations which govern the sharing of confidential information in a healthcare setting in the uk so in this tutorial i will define what confidentiality is explain legislations including the general data protection act and analyze when it is necessary to disclose confidential information. So confidentiality in a medical setting refers to the principle of keeping secure and secret from others information given by or about an individual in a course of professional relationship. This is from the British Medical Association and it's the right of every patient even after death so even after death patients are entitled to have their to have their information kept confidential so in the uk one of the legislations that governs the sharing of confidential information is access to health records act 1990 so the duty of confidential confidentiality remains after the patient has died this provides the right of access to the deceased patient representative and any person who may who may have a claim arising out of the patient's death so access is limited or refused if the patient did not agree ex accepted their information being disclosed to, to the applicant so if if for example a family member of someone or someone from the general public submitted a form to get a confidential information of a person that has died then they can be refused if it is thought that disclosure may cause mental or physical harm to others so it will not be disclosed if 
the disclosed information will cause harm to others. If the information disclosed is about a third party, such as a healthcare professional involved in the deceased person's care who have not been who have not given consent. So if a per, if a medical professional was involved in the care of a deceased person and they don't want their information to be disclosed to a family member, then they have the right to not have their information be disclosed to any other person. Another legislation is Access to Medical Report Act 1988, which is England, Scotland and Wales. So it gives patients the right to see their medical record, amend any parts of their medical record to record their disagreement. So for example, if a patient is applying for life insurance and they find things that they believe to not be true or incorrect in their medical record, they have the right to amend those reports. Or for example, if, if a treatment after treatment, they got better and they no longer impacted by, a, for example, a physical health, then they have the right to amend any health records. Another one is the Care Act to 2014, which is governs England. And this requires relevant partners to cooperate with local authorities about adults at risk. So this is associated with adults with disabilities or anyone who's adult who might be facing, for example, domestic abuse or any other forms of abuse. Relevant partners include NHS Trust, so the National Health National Health Service Trust. Certain persons or bodies must also give information to safeguarding adults board to enable them to perform their functions. So if a nurse is worried about the patient, then they can share the information with a safeguarding adult board. For example, in the case of domestic abuse, they can share that with the safeguarding adult board, who will then try and provide assistance to the patient. Another one is the Mental Capacity Act 2005, and this is active in England and Wales. So information can be shared with anyone who is authorised to make a decision on behalf of or who is appointed to support or represent a patient who lacks capacity. So anyone with disability, disability, children who have guardian and parents, this information can be shared with them, with the parents and guardian, and also social workers. This might be a welfare attorney, a co-appointed deputy or a guardian, or an independent mental health capacity advocate. The Abortion Regulation Act 1991 is active in England and Wales, a doctor who has carried out a termination is required to notify the appropriate chief medical officer within seven days of the procedure. The Health Protection Act, sorry, it should be P, Protection Act notification regulation to, to 2010 which is active in England doctors must notify the appropriate person or body of a suspected case of certain infectious diseases or contamination so this is where doctors and the government for example will be notified um, for example in the case of COVID-19 the first person that was infected in the UK would have been identified and then this the information about that particular individual would be shared with the particular body in government that that is that is responsible for health such as NHS that information would be shared with that with that particular organization so then they know how the person became infected where they went and what their symptoms were this will allow them to prevent the spread of the disease lastly we have the general data protection act 2018 which controls how a person's personal information is used by organizations business or the government it gives people the right to find out what information the government and other organizations store about them other legislations concerning confidentiality is the Crime and Disorder Act 1998 and the Terrorism Act 2000. But in both cases, for example, if a police officer comes into the hospital, that doesn't necessarily mean you just hand over all the information. You have to get the right documents to share the information and the right processes and procedures must be followed. You can't just hand over because you don't know if the police have the right to be obtaining this information. If the police present you with the right documents, then you hand over the information. So that is the end of the lesson. Thank you for tuning in.